So ladies and gentlemen, sit back, <coughs> oh, and relax, and enjoy, I don't want to introduce, Mr. Stefan. Come on out, mister. <laughs> It's so great to have you here today. I'm Stefan. Stefan. Mr. Stefan makes me sound like a hairdresser. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was helping me kind of dragging my hair comb backstage, but that's okay. So we're going to start the show and we'll turn it over to Stefan. Too much. 
The film did manage to break box office records for the first few weeks, but the major notoriety must be given to Erte's costumes, in which the actors at a sumptuous ball were dressed as gods and goddesses of foreign countries. And here we have Frisia, one of the Germanic gods. Charles Spencer, a noted theater historian and author of the first book on Erte, wrote, the detail of the robes is astonishing in inventiveness, precision, erotic suggestion, and playful humor. They are not merely designs for dresses. The figures are performers in movement or repose, full of energy, grace, or statuesque dignity. And the Zeus and his lovely wife, Hera. Without a doubt, he goes on to say, they are among the finest costume designs of the century. Erte led a fantastic life during a fantastic time, or times, I should say. He created a world that we, as, our, as outsiders, are constantly dazzled by. Bejeweled showgirls, oriental genies, gods and goddesses, fabulous images in a myriad of colors, and stark black and white fashions of the once and future woman. This is the world of Erte. Through his fashions, paintings, and theatrical creations, he had become a major force of design during the 20th century. He was born Romain Vitirtov in St. Petersburg, Russia on November 23, 1892, November 10th by the Russian calendar. His father, Pyotr Ivanovich Vitirtov, was inspector at the St. Petersburg Naval School. The Vitirtovs settled in St. Petersburg when the city was established by Peter the Great. The Tartar family was of Tartar origin. Tartars ruled Russia for over 200 years until they were conquered by Tsar Ivan III. Now all the Tartar Khans surrendered except one, Erte's ancestor, Khan Tirt, who held out until the reign of Ivan the Terrible. Now since this Ivan had guns and Khan Tirt had none, he was forced to surrender. Now the previous Khans were compensated with the title of prince, thus Khan Urus then became Prince Urusov, but Khan Tirt was downgraded to the status of hereditary nobleman, so he was entitled to use the DE in front of his name, Dittirtov, or he could use von Tirtov when traveling in German countries. Erte's mother, Natalia Mikhailova Nikolenko, was of Ukrainian origin. She had a brother who was a prominent architect and an 18th century ancestor who had been a sculptor. And it may have been these precedents that led his mother to overcome family objections to Romain's artistic abilities, since all the de Tirtov men ended their careers as admirals in the Tsar's Navy. St. Petersburg was considered to be a very French city. The Franco-Russian Pact of 1892 consolidated military and cultural ties and it later brought Russia into World War II. And there were three imperial theaters in St. Petersburg. The Mariinsky, which had opera and ballet. The Alexandrinsky, for Russian and foreign classical drama. And the Mikhailovsky, which had a French repertoire. Erte attended his first performance at the age of seven. His family had a private box at each theater, and he went to every performance and eventually learned the entire opera repertoire. The impact of the ballet was even greater, so much so that when young Romain insisted on taking lessons, he wound up being taught by one of the great choreographers, Marius Petipov. Erte's love of all the movement of the ballet is evidence in his designs, for he always tries to show the flow of the costumes in his paintings. The sumptuousness of Erte's costumes can be traced to the influence of the Russian Orthodox Church, Ritualistic groupings and tableaus of these dazzling figures to a child must have been more glamorous than any Ziegfeld decor. Russian ritual and religious art is evidence in all the great Russian artists of Erte's generation. This painting is of a religious procession in the province of Kursk by Ilya Repin, whom Erte studied under when he was a boy. The symbol of the Russian icon, encrusted with precious stones and ropes of pearls, the sumptuous patterns and linear compositions can be later compared to many of the decorative styles in Erte's costumes. 
And here we have the fountains of the Winter Palace, which now serves as the Hermitage Museum. The Hermitage houses one of the finest art collections in the world. And they have a marvelous collection of Greek vases. And young Romain de Tirtoff went as often as he could to see these ancient artifacts. Imagine being a child and walking into a museum that looked more like a fairy tale palace than anything else. Now, these simple line drawings of the ancient Greeks intrigued him. It was to become an influence on him later when these paintings were taken by his own sophisticated hand and transformed into fashion designs that filled the pages of Harper's Bazaar magazine during the 1920s. In his father's library was a book on Indian and Persian miniatures. The young boy would go every night after dinner to look at these beautiful paintings. This is perhaps the greatest influence on Erte's art. From these paintings, he learned about color and composition, and the development of the Erte woman began, sensuous <coughs> and thin, with slanted eyes and a high arched brow, des yeux de biche, as they were called in France, meaning eyes of the doe. As he said himself, the Erte woman is based on what I would like to be if I was a woman. And the Persian miniatures have definitely influenced it. If any one person was to influence him, it was his mother. Her milk-white skin and blue-black hair gained his ideal of feminine beauty. He said, when I was five years old, I designed an evening gown for my mother. She liked it so much that she had it executed, and it was a huge success. I shall always remember one night when I was quite young, she came into my room to give me a good night kiss before going to a ball. She wore a dress of black chantilly lace over pink taffeta, and around her decolletage was a garland of real roses. I was so absolutely enchanted by the perfume and beauty of her image. Perhaps that was the beginning of my love for all things connected with beautiful clothes and elegance. Now, as I said earlier, the de Tirtoff men, since the time of Peter the Great, always ended their careers as admirals. It was quite evident that Romain de Tirtoff was not going to follow suit. When his father resigned himself to that fact, he urged his son to at least be a respectable artist, which meant being an architect. The boy agreed, although that meant staying in school for another year, which he detested. But after passing his baccalaureate exam with high distinction, his father decided to reward him. What would you like for a present, he asked. And the reply was, a passport. <laughs> well, after much family debate, Romain de Tirtoff boarded a train in February of 1912, armed with his passport, his savings, and a small monthly allowance from an uncle, and he headed for Paris. Unknown to his family, he visited the offices of Damsky Mir, a fashion magazine, and arranged to send them drawings of new Paris fashions to help supplement his income. And these early sketches were done about the time of his graduation, and you can see the development of his style beginning. These early works were signed either Romain or Pitch, which was a childhood nickname. The first year that he had in Paris was very difficult. He couldn't find any work for nine months, and he lived on a diet of roast chestnuts, which he bought from street vendors, and pot au feu, which was the cheapest item on the cafe menus. In December of 1912, he finally got work as a designer in a second-class dress shop called Caroline's. At the end of that month, she fired him and said, let me give you a mother's advice. Give up the idea of becoming an artist. You have no talent for it. Well, he asked if he could have his drawings back. She said, they're all in the wastebasket. So he retrieved them. He wrapped them up in a parcel. And he took them over to the concierge of Paul Poiret. The next day, he received a letter from Poiret saying he found the designs interesting and could he please come over right away. Paul Poiret was literally the king of the Paris couture. What he did was to revolutionize women's fashion. And here he is dressed as a sultan for one of the many fancy dress balls that he used to give. And he ruled his business like a sultan too. Erte said on first meeting him, he was reminded of an Assyrian bull. Poiret's major influence on his designs 
were taken from the ballet Russe, which took Paris by storm just a few years earlier. After the turn of the century, the Russians came on with their music, their dancing, their extraordinary use of color. Sergei Diaghilev brought the ballet Russe to Paris and the world, and nothing was the same ever again. People talked of Nijinsky, who brought the male dancer to the forefront, and they were dazzled by the designs of Leon Baxt. The influence on the area of fashion was tremendous. The Russian look was definitely in, as was its counterpart in the mysterious East, thanks to that great lady, Scheherazade. Now here we have a photograph of Anna Held, the first Mrs. Florence Ziegfeld, in a typical gown from the turn of the century. Now Paul Poiret understood that the new modern woman required an entirely different shape. He banished the corset and the fitted bodice. His dresses were based on simple vertical lines rather than decorative curves. This poire dress is called sorbet. It is made of satin and silk chiffon. The lamp-shaped tunic, inspired by the costumes of the ballet russe, is embroidered with tiny glass beads. Now, poire employed the finest fashion illustrators of his day and he published their works in little books for his clients. Here is a design for a theater wrap drawn by Georges Lepau. And 99 times out of 100, these fashion designs were placed in little dramatic situations, such as this one entitled, Have I Come Too Early? <laughs> you see the woman arriving at the Loge Theater in her beautiful gown, and nobody is sitting there to see her in it. Well, Erte picked up on this design, and he later used it to full advantage in his works for Harper's Bazaar. Another great illustrator used by Poiré was Georges Barbier. This is another design for a theater gown and wrap, highlighted by this scene called The Lady's Advisor. And what better advice could a lady receive than from her mirror? Now here we have some examples of some of the first designs that Erte did for Poiré. Again, note the variations on the lamp-shaped tunic. This hat design shows what is believed to be the first use of Erte's signature. He adopted the pseudonym Erte because he said if he was a failure, he didn't want to bring shame to his family's name. So he took his initials from Romain, he took the R, which in French is Air, from Tirtov, he took the T, which in French is Te, and that makes Erte. So Erte went to work for Poiré and he began designing dresses, coats, headdresses, hats, handbags. And then one day, Poiré asked him to design costumes for a new play that he received a commission on called Le Minaret. Now Poiré established a range of colors for each act. Green, black, and silver for act one, red, black, and gold for act two, and silver and orange for act three. No one had ever done this before, but after Le Minaret, it became the thing to do, especially in the French music halls. One of the first costumes that Erte was des designed was for an oriental dancer named Mata Hari. Erte said she had a sensuous body, but her face lacked personality. And there was something even a little vulgar about her. I never thought that she had the intelligence to be an effective spy. Now, I must apologize for that photo. It was the only one that I could find of her. I don't know if that was an oriental pose or she had a slight case of sciatica. <laughs> now, this is one of the Oriental dancing costumes that he designed for her. It was after the success of the Minaret that Poiré started to give Erte royalties on his designs. Now I'm jumping a little bit ahead in time here. Uh, this dress was not designed until 1924, uh, but it had such a dramatic pose I wanted to use it to illustrate a little story. Erte took a box to attend a dress rehearsal of a new play. Dress rehearsals were always attended by high society then, and he invited one of Poiré's models to accompany his party. Now, Poiré's models were always allowed to borrow dresses from the collection if they were going to attend a particularly smart affair. Erte decided to add some spice to the occasion. The model was able to get a hold of a dress that had an ermine and red velvet coat Erte decided to wear the dress himself, with a red velvet turban, 
long red gloves, and large gold earrings. When they entered the box, the whole audience turned and stared at them. The next day, the newspaper said, in that brilliant audience, all eyes were fixed on one of the boxes where two of Poiré's models were sitting, <laughs> accompanied by four gentlemen in evening dress. One model was an attractive blonde, but the other, with her scarlet turban, was irresistible. <laughs> Wearing her remarkable ensemble with an air and sense of style that few models are lucky enough to possess. The next morning, Poiré read that article, and after checking around, he summoned Erte to his office. Expecting the worst, Erte was surprised when Poiré offered to design a series of dresses for him to model at the next collection. <laughs> Erte said he found the idea entertaining, but said he felt he was born to be an artist and designer and not a model. Mm -hmm. Well, during this period of working for Poiré, Erte had many opportunities to attend fancy dress balls, and naturally he always went in his own designs. Here he is as a Spanish matador. Now, when I was on a lecture tour in the summer of 2006, I spoke at a gallery which actually had the matador costume, and they let me photograph it to my delight. Now, within the lining of the cape was a piece of old masking tape. When the gallery director, Ken Lawrence, pulled it away, he discovered it was covering up a hidden pocket. He reached into the pocket, and what he pulled out was Erte's personal powder puff so he could freshen his makeup during the night's festivities. <laughs> now, here he is, dressed as an Egyptian mummy. He was actually carried into the event by two attendants who unwrapped him from yards of gold satin. <laughs> His most talked about costume was entitled Claire de Lune. The Russian artist, Princess Arisov Kazak, had him pose for a painting in it. The costume is now in the collection of the Victoria Albert Museum, and the painting is actually owned by a couple that I know down in the South Bay of San Francisco. Now, at the time, Erte was criticized for wearing such outlandish costumes like this, but he said he didn't care because he always won first prize. <laughs> In the summer of 1913, Erte met with a distant cousin, Prince Nicholas Horosov. He arrived in Paris en route to London, where his brother Sergei, who was married to the niece of the Red Sultan of Turkey, Abu Hamid, arranged for Nicholas an engagement to an American millionaires. Well, after spending some time with her in London, Nicholas knew that the marriage was not going to happen, and the engagement was broken. He returned to Paris just before World War I and moved in with Herte. He became his closest friend, but more important, his business manager during Herte's most successful period to come. The war broke out in August of 1914. Herte had been with Poiré for 18 months. He had not only witnessed the makings of the greatest dress house, but had come under the influence of other extraordinary and gifted decorative artists. He learned the methods and the requirements of designing for the stage, and he took from Poiré a knowledge of fashion houses and magazines. His inexperience, however, led to a parting clash with Poiré, which resulted in permanent animosity. Poiré's shop closed with the war, and Erte, in need of work, joined forces with one of Erte's leading dressmakers. And he had cards printed up that said, Erte et Adrienne, the latter described as a former premier de Poiré. Well, Poiré sued to prevent the use of his name, and Erte had to pay considerable damages, and he never spoke to Poiré again. Now, this incident may account for the fact that, although Poiré's biography was published in 1930, by which time Erte was renowned, Poiré does not once mention Erte's name. It must also be noted that in Erte's essay on modern dress, in the 1929 Encyclopedia Britannica, Erte never mentions Poiré. Well, after this unfortunate incident, Erte and Nicholas moved to Monte Carlo. In need of work, he decided to send some designs to an American fashion magazine. He decided to toss a coin between Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. Harper's it was. He sent some designs, and several months later, he received a check and a note asking for more. This was his first cover, which appeared in January of 1915, entitled Scheherazade. 
Well, after two issues with Harper's Bazaar, Vogue requested drawings too, and Erte agreed as he had no contract with Harper's Bazaar. When William Randolph Hearst found out what Vogue was doing, he signed Erte to an exclusive contract to do all their covers and fashion illustrations for the next 10 years. Erte's original and ingenious covers helped to boost sales, and his fashion illustrations were just as exciting. Here are some typical excerpts from the publisher. October, 1917. To glance at an Erte is amusing. To look at one is interesting. To study one is absorbing. That any human being can conceive and execute such exquisite detail is positively miraculous. And we become even more impressed when we consider his combination of colors and materials. January 1918. The designer for one of the best New York houses told us the other day that he obtained more ideas from Erte's drawings in the bazaar than from any other source of fashion. Many others to whom originality and good taste means everything have told us the same thing. From Erte, they take a touch here and adapt it to their own needs. The world of the theater was very exciting to Erte. It was natural to him. And none of it is more in evidence than in the covers of Harper's Bazaar. His early covers were often fantasy stage sets with incredibly gowned women, all revealing little allegorical stories in their execution. The issue of January 1918 states, your Harper's Bazaar this month is graced by the most significant allegorical cover Erte has ever conceived. It represents the spirit of France, awakening sleeping America. The crowing cock portrays France. The woman is America. The spirit of France is yet unscathed by the hungry flames typifying the German invasion, in warning America to abandon the bed of gold on which she has been sleeping in fancied security, rousing her to action before the flames shall attack her as the, they shall attack Europe. 1924 saw a change in style. The symbolic imagery vanished, along with the little moral tales. Figures now, instead of being festooned with rich garments, are simplified to humorous visual ideas. It was the appearance of the flapper, whose clothes were in primary colors, less fussy, less formal, more consciously elegant. Coco Chanel took the fashion world by storm with her simple black dress. Erte became bored with the fashion world then, and 1926 saw the end of his fashion illustrations in the magazine. Covers became more stylized, influenced mainly by cubism. In 1933, Carmel Snow took over as editor, and she began putting restrictions on Erte's work. Not at all a good idea when artists are so concerned with their own creative freedom. At first, Miss Snow wanted to see preliminary sketches from which she would then pick and choose the covers. She also began to put in other artists, most notably the famed poster designer A.M. Cassandra. Erte's covers became bolder, more graphic, with large areas of a single color and very little decoration. By 1936, his second 10-year contract with Harper's Bazaar was up, and he decided not to renew. The new mode for magazine covers was beginning photographed models, and it was the end of an era. But during this period, however, Erte illustrations were seen in many other publications as well. Hearst Cosmopolitan, Art and Industry, Illustration, Femina, The Sketch, and this Christmas illustration from the Illustrated London News. Erte met George White in 1923 and their association lasted through the golden age of the music hall. This costume was worn during a musical production number that tried to resolve the conflict between classical music and jazz. And it ended with this fantastic display as the orchestra played George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. The George White scandals introduced what became many American standards. One was, I'll build a stairway to paradise. Erte designed a staircase where the steps lit up in different colors as the singer ascended the stairs. And we are proud to have the Westchester University Singers led by Dr. Emily Bullock. And I think we need to go back.
Now, not only was there a long association with George White's scandals, but also with the Folie Berger. And although he did beautiful designs for Plo Ziegfeld, Erte designed only the Follies of 1923. That's one of the actual showgirls from 1923. <laughs> Next slide. Erte's tableau and costumes for the Maiden of Gold number were truly spectacular. It was publicized that over three miles of gold lame was supplied by a factory in Lyon, France. And this was in the day when gold lame was still made with real gold. Erte's designs of the popular French draping style had a tendency to hide the female figure that Ziegfeld always sought to enhance. Now, Victor Herbert wrote this beautiful wall for the Ziegfeld Follies of 1923, entitled, I've Loved to Waltz Through Life With You. And here to interpret this lovely tune is Mr. A. J. Shidley. <laughs> Scandals, 
which brought about one major innovation, what Erte called the costume collectif. That was a costume that was worn by more than one person. Or sometimes it was a costume that became part of the set. The George White scandals of 1926 established a new dance craze with a new song. Here to sing the Black Bottom is the Westchester University Singers to be followed by Karen Balayette singing The Birth of the Blues. <laughs>
Dante's technique for a moment. His renderings, you notice, are devoid of any kind of shading to show fullness of material or bulk of cloth. Instead, what we get is this wonderful, refined line, very pure and very exact, painted by a hand as fluid as water, yet steady as iron. And in the previous drawings that we saw by Barbier and Le Pape, uh, we were aware of their two-dimensionality. Verte's designs are two-dimensional too, but his characters have a solidity about them, a weight, a fullness, if you will, as if they're animated characters ready to spring to life. In 1924, Erte received a letter from Louis B. Mayer asking him to come to Hollywood to design a new movie called Paris. Next slide. MGM released this advertisement, Erte, now 33 years old, surrounded by the stars that he was going to design for. Next slide. Erte arrived in America to much pomp and ceremony. Newspapers and magazines interviewed him a total of 197 times. <coughs> there were many script problems which caused delays on the making of Paris, so Erte was given other assignments to keep him busy. The first being a costume for Carmel Myers in the movie Ben-Hur. This is what she wore to the chariot races. <laughs> Carmel Myers played Eros, the vamp, to Ramon Navarro's Ben-Hur. She used her wicked wiles to expose Ben-Hur as the unknown Jew, which is what he was billed as at the chariot race. Now, all the cast from the 1925 silent version was invited to the premiere of the 1959 remake. That's the one we've all seen with Charlton Heston. And Carmel Myers noticed that the character of Eros was eliminated. She asked the director, William Wyler, why? What happened? He took her aside, whispered in her ear, he couldn't find anyone as beautiful as she was to play the part. <laughs> well, he again designed for her in The Devil's Circus. <coughs> Other films included Dance Madness. Actress Eileen Pringle in a masked ball is meant to represent the cat in a kind of Charleston dancing dress, all pearls and rhinestones and sequins. Now, during this waiting period, he also designed a float, next slide, which was to represent MGM in the first motion picture electrical parade and pageant at the LA Coliseum. On the float were these four figures who represented laughter, drama, tears, and comedy. There was also a Hollywood-sponsored fashion show entitled Her Day. Erte contributed several fashion designs, including this one worn by Norma Shearer. Now, Erte made many friends during his stay in Hollywood, including the ballet instructor Theodore Kosloff, who added many of Erte's paintings into his own collection. <coughs> one of the true regrets in Erte's life was that due to being in Hollywood in 1925, he was unable to attend the Paris Exposition that year. His paintings, though, were on display, as seen here in this interior design exhibit. Note the art on the wall is this Erte design for a show curtain. And there was a new actress auditioning at MGM at that time that Erte designed for. He said, when I met her, she was still called Lucille Le Sur. She was the prototype for an Italian Madonna with her hair parted in the middle. Lovely eyes, they remained, but she had a big bust and she had big hips. And I was absolutely amazed that in a few months when they changed her name to Joan Crawford, she would change so completely. <laughs> Another film with Eileen Pringle called The Mystic. And Miss Pringle was a San Francisco-born actress whose fame was based on her resemblance to the writer Eleanor Boleyn. The Mystic also starred Conway Tyrrell and was directed by Todd Browning, who was most famous for directing the original Dracula with Bela Lugosi. Actress Gwen Lee wore this Erte creation in A Little Bit of Broadway, a minor backstage drama, 
and he designed lavish and playful costumes for Time the Comedian. And in the film La Boheme, the role of Mimi was played by Lillian Gish, seen here with leading man John Gilbert. For the role of the unhappy little seamstress, Erte chose cheap wool and cotton to give the impression of poverty. Miss Gish protested, saying her skin could only tolerate the finest silk because she acted with every pore. <laughs> well, this pretentiousness caused Erte to lose his temper, and he showed her the door. In 1969, in Lillian Gish's autobiography, she of course turned the story to her advantage, saying that old worn silk looks better on film and that the calico outfit by air tape would look like a nice new dress. Miss Gish tried to persuade the rest of the cast to join her boycott of air tape's costumes, but they refused. So fortunately for us, tragic stars like René Adore and John Gilbert wore <coughs> air tape creations, and Miss Gish wore costumes by, well, let's just say someone else. <laughs> uh, by the way, this is the uh, famous scene where John Gilbert tells René Adore that she is the greatest thing to happen to him since sliced bread. <laughs> and she responds, is that a baguette or are you just happy to see me? <laughs> <laughs> well, by the end of Erte's contract, the script for Paris was done, and Erte was very displeased. The hero of the story was a fashion designer named Morand, who lived in, of all places, the Louvre. All of Erte's modern settings, such as this dining room, were set in Versailles and other historical areas of Paris. Needless to say, Erte canceled his contract and the film was never made. Paris was to have been the first film made with a new technicolor process, which was still in its infancy. And it's a shame that for a man who's thrived on such beautiful colors, that he was not able to make the first color film. Now this scene, called the Ballet of Pearls, from the movie Paris, this blue curtain, and you see swiped on the side, was originally closed, and a nude gilded slave stands in the middle of the stage with cords, which he then releases as two counterbalances. And you'll see at the bottom, on either side, are women dressed up as giant tassels. As they're lowered to the floor, the curtain opens, so it makes it look like the weight of the women is opening the curtains and it reveals a giant coffer on stage. The lock, and you see in the center, uh, that round design, the lock is formed by two lovers that are kissing. At the Sultan's orders, the lovers are slain with a dagger, which opens the lock, revealing a casket of maidens impersonating all various uses of pearls. Maidens like this one. Now, although Paris was never realized as a film, MGM retained Erte's costumes and used them in the first all-talking, all-singing, all-dancing movie musical, The Hollywood Review of 1929. Erte's curl costumes were featured in an underwater ballet sequence. And MGM's most famous song, Singing in the Rain, was originally written for the Hollywood Music Box Review of 1929 and it was sung by the Ziegfeld girl, Miss Doris Eaton. Later on, they actually used it in this film, and it was sung by Cliff Edwards, also known as Ukulele Ike. Jerry for me for a moment. My fault. Pause the... That's fine. Brad, everyone excuse me. Brad, can you put the sound cord into the laptop? <laughs> I'm so sorry folks, but sometimes Ted just goes so quickly. <coughs> and in your program you will see that Meryl Grant was supposed to be singing the rain today, but she has the flu. So we're going to give you this film, and I totally forgot Mr. Brad to plug in the sound, because this film has sound to it. Just give him a little moment, and he'll make that happen. So 
Jerry, go back two slides if you would. One more. Hang right there if you would, Jerry. Everyone having a good time so far? Yeah. I have learned so much in just a few moments here. You ready to go? Not too loud because it'll be blaring. Okay, well, we're not on yet. He's got to get hit. So take it down a little bit, Brad. It might be too loud. Okay, click click it on again for us, Jerry, if you would. Now go back, go back. Now roll your mouse around and there we go. Hit the play button. There's no sound at first, so just hang on, be patient. When the curtain opens, the sound will start. Not too loud. Hang on. Here we go. Now the curtain. Most notable 
the unexpected death of Nicholas. In Erte's own words, I was in despair. We spent nearly 20 years together. Nicholas shared my youthful dreams, my joys, and my disappointments. My world seemed to crumble about me, and I felt like the sole survivor of a banished era. Well, without the exposure in Harper's Bazaar, and with the growing political troubles in Europe, eventually, Erte was forgotten in America, and there are very distinct changes in Erte's designs for the next few decades. He could no longer depend on the lavishness so abundant during the Roaring Twenties. The exotic mechanical effects of the theater were no longer being used, nor for that matter the same standard of dressmaking and decoration. Next slide. There was a bolder, more cartoon-like style to his designs. Whispers of the oriental and historical images remained, but instead of the Arabian Nights exotica for which he was famed, there was now a subdued passion the sensuality of South Sea Islands, Bali, and Mexico. Also, 30s fashion returned to a longer, more feminine line, which Erte preferred over the boyish flapper look. One of his most charming sets of costumes was made for a show at the London Palladium entitled London Symphony. There were four sets of showgirls, <coughs> symphonies in white, gray, black, and brown. Here we have symphony in gray, the woman's arms are hidden in the fox fur sleeves, and when raised to hide her coquettish smile, the effect gives the silhouette of a mushroom. <laughs> Symphony in Black is the most reproduced of all of Erte's designs. Unusual in its concept, she is nonetheless striking. The use of fur harkens back to his childhood in Russia. The dog, sleek and modern, is streamlined Art Deco at its best. <clears throat> To me, this is the consummate Erte woman, tall and sexy, glamorous yet undesirous, elegant with a touch of wit. When Erte continued to work through the 40s and 50s, his last work in America was for the Golden Gate International Exposition on Treasure Island. No surprise there, as the producer of the show was George White. To date, it has been estimated that Erte has done over 25,000 different designs. In 1951, Erte was approached by the Paris Opera to design a new production of La Traviata to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Verdi's death. It was a happy coincidence that he had already designed for himself his own fantasy production 12 years earlier in 1939. But the opera director accepted them on the spot. Erte's surrealistic concept of La Traviata shocked both the opera world and the press. Because of this, there were many articles attacking his concept. On the other hand, some critics responded to the novelty and showered praise on him. Erte was delighted with both responses because no one was indifferent, and whether they liked it or not, he was still being talked about. The Paris Opera also commissioned designers for Mozart's Cosifantuti, and Manuel Rosenthal's delightful one-act opera, La Poule Noire. And here is pictured the widow Constance. Originally commissioned in 1937 for the Comédie des Champs-Élysées, its revival was staged in 1956 by the opera Comique. And once again, it was decided that only Erte's humorous, over-the-top designs could do justice to this witty, farcical opera. Erte was also kept busy with other opera productions, ballets, and music hall reviews. Volumes could be written on his work in this area alone, but Erte was always looking to the future and to new ideas, and that materialized in 1964. They form a picturelle, a series of abstract sculptures representing differing emotions or thoughts. They were made of wood, metal, tree roots, covered with multiple layers of brightly colored oil paints. Erte was inspired to make these images, he said, while lying on the beach in Mallorca. These visions came to him while he was in a trance-like state, and he saw the sun bouncing off the shimmering waters of the sea. The 1960s were a rejuvenation period for Erte. He returned to the United States in triumph, designing spectaculars for Radio City Music Hall the New York World's Fair. And for our northern neighbor of Canada, the show Flying Colors for Expo 67. 
Erte also had an enjoyable association with the Latin Quarter nightclub for several years. It opened in 1942 and was run by Lou Walters, father of Barbara. Here we see Erte set and performers for the Diamond Fair in 1964. And in the, oh, go back. Oh, go back. In the upper right hand corner, you will see Ziegfeld Society's own Darlene Larson. Okay, next slide. Even ABC TV jumped on the Erte bandwagon. In 1967, they had Erte design costumes for the televised ballet, The Silent Night. It was filled with delightful creations, such as this gingerbread girl and boy. And there was a boy and girl dancer representing everyone's favorite, chocolate. 1967 was also the time of a major exhibition in New York City. The entire collection of 179 works was purchased by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The following exhibition in London had 800 works on display. The entire alphabet suite, uh, not in the upper left you see the letter B, was purchased by Lord and Lady Beaumont of Whitley. Actress Susanna York bought all the sets and costumes that Erte had done in Hollywood. John Russell, the art critic of the Sunday Times in London said, if Michelangelo were to come back from the dead, he could hardly have greater or more eulogious publicity than has been accorded to Erte. <laughs> Retrospectives in galleries and museums the world over began. Major awards were bestowed upon him from American theater organizations. Here we see him getting one from our own designer, Edith Head. And he also received the title of Officer of Arts and Letters from the French government. He's met with many superstars who own many of his paintings in their own personal collections. He even received an Art Deco Preservation Award from the Art Deco Society of California, and it was presented to him by someone who hopes that there will be a lecture on him someday. <laughs> In 1969, he did the illustrations for Milton Strachey's book, Ermintrude and Esmeralda. 1969 also saw the beginnings of his limited edition graphics, many of which were based on his covers from Harper's Bazaar. The success of Erte's limited edition prints was phenomenal, to say the least. One of my favorite pieces, which shows his cleverness, is from The Numbers, human figures representing zero through nine, here is the number four. And you'll notice the flower between the woman's legs is cup-shaped. Cups are meant to be filled. What with? The man's flower has a very impressive stamen. And notice where their hands are joined at the top? The couple become one as his stamen enters her cup-shaped flower. But if you look real close, you'll notice that she's frowning. It's obvious. He didn't use Miracle Grow. <laughs> <laughs> the success of the prints was soon followed by limited edition bronzes, Objet d'art, and Art to Wear. In July 1980, he gave us magnificent sets and costumes for De Rosenkavalier at the Glyndebourne Opera Company. When John Cox, the artistic director, called Erte's manager and asked if Erte would like to design De Rosenkavalier, the response was a typical manager's response. When? How many sets? How many costumes? How much will you pay? <clears throat> well, Glyndebourne is the only opera company in Europe that is totally without government subsidy. So to continue their high standards, they spent wisely and frugally on the visual aspects and thorough rehearsal. Economies are made on artist fees. And when the fee was mentioned, Erte's manager said, you realize Erte gets that from one poster. <laughs> Fortunately, Erte had always wanted to do De Rosen Cavalier, and he had no qualms at all regarding the fee. At Erte's suggestion, however, the opera was taken out of the late 18th century and placed in the mid-19th century. He saw that era as more romantic and more likely to create the fantasy of Strauss's adult fairy tale. In 1982, Sobrani of London, a tobacco company and sponsor of the Sobrani Bridge Challenge, 
set out to produce a unique set of playing cards that would reflect the elegant, sophisticated image of their cigarettes. They could only be designed by air tip. And here we see the Joker, the Jack, Queen, and King of Spades. This was soon followed by another set of playing cards published by Alfred Dunhill, based on Erte's designs for that 1951 production of La Traviata. The Joker, as you can see, is the conductor. The face cards are the major characters of the opera. The Queen is Violetta, the King is her lover, Alfredo, and the Jack, or Viceroy, is Baron Dufault, his rival, each accompanied by their own musical themes. The numbered cards show in silhouette scenes from the opera with their own musical themes as well. So when the entire deck is laid out, hearts, diamonds, clubs, and spades, it tells the entire story of La Traviata. This wonderful man was elegant and flamboyant. His ideas were outrageous to some, and he had all kinds of accusations written about him during the heyday of the 1920s and 30s but he could never be accused of being boring. Erte was in the midst of building a home on Mallorca, presumably for his approaching old age when he passed away. He died in Paris on Saturday, April 21st, 1990, at the tender age of 97. Now these are some of his designs for a Broadway-bound show, which unfortunately did not make it to Broadway, but I did get to see it in San Francisco a few years ago. There was a big band review called Stardust, which featured the music of many different composers, but all the songs had the lyrics of Mitchell Parrish. Erte truly outdid himself with imaginative designs and an almost insane attention to detail. And for Erte, no expense was spared. If they used beads, they were crystal beads. If they used a fur trim, it was black Siberian fox. Erte only lived long enough to see one of his costumes realized, and that was the stardust dress. And here we have Walter Willison to sing the title song, Stardust. <laughs> Yeah. 
more about this gentleman right over here.